Well, it's a few minutes after 10, uh, 1 o'clock. <laughs> I screwed up. And I don't see anybody in the room with me right now, which means that I did really screw up there. But uh, I said I'd do a live stream at 1 o'clock, and here I am, and it is a little bit past 1 o'clock. And uh, I was actually running around doing a bunch of other stuff. And there's Johnny Knoxville first in the room. Thank you, my friend. Congratulations for finding me. And I apologize. I did say 1 o'clock. And then Johnny sent me a note and said, Steve, you're not on. <laughs> I thought to myself, wait a second. And in my mind, I was thinking I had more time. And I, I don't know how time got away from me. Actually, I know exactly how it got away from me. But, but that's, that's another story altogether. So um, Gene is in the room now as is Johnny and Sharon. Sharon is down there near Atlanta, Georgia, where they've been having all kinds of trouble calculating water bills for some weird reason. Daniel Crenshaw, The Tribe, BP23. Wow, I've never seen you live. Hey, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we do these from time to time. Uh, Chef James Weston, Duncan Campbell checking in from way down under. Greg Martin, Emmanuel, who, by the way, has ordered some books for me. Thank you very much. Toby Kenobi. I got to like saying Toby Kenobi, Georgiana Thornton checking in from San Antonio. All you need. What's up, Steve? And Steve Moynarnik uh, checking in as well. And now it's going so fast that I can't keep up, which I appreciate. So thank you very much for everybody joining in today. Uh, I did say I would do a live. And, and so we did a couple Friday afternoons. And Friday afternoons didn't work out that well for everybody. So I said, I'm going to try to do a weekend one. I was hoping I could do one on uh, Saturday or Sunday. And so I said, I'll do one on Sunday. I think we used to do Sunday afternoons, right? So um, I went for a little walk today. And I think that's actually what threw my timing off. Um, so I am here now. And I will tell you that I've, <laughs> in an attempt to, and I'll have to go through this three or four times today. But this right here is the folding chair that used to be further back by the wall underneath the window. And that is a folding chair from the Italian Hall, where the Italian Hall disaster took place. And because of these slats and being out of focus up against that back wall there, a lot of people said, hey, Steve, is that a guitar amplifier back there? I said, no, 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 that's a folding chair. And a lot of people were, were insisting that it was, in fact, a, a guitar amplifier, <laughs> which I would know more about uh, whether or not it's a guitar amplifier, but it is, in fact, a folding chair. And I'm not sure if I can, you know, I can't reach with my headphones on. But um, it's a wooden chair that was in the Italian hall the night of the disaster. And so um, I've had that in my possession now for over 10 years. Thank you very much, Georgiana. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I've, I've kept that near me at all times. It's usually in my studio. I, at one point in time, had it sitting next to my chair so that when I was on the air shooting a video, you'd see the chair sitting right here. Uh, but because the way my studio is all flummoxed right now, uh, I have it right off camera, but it's there. It's always nearby. So um, I, I, I like to keep the chair there. There are some famous photographs of the Italian Hall the morning after the disaster. And there are uh, a lot of these folding chairs in the room. And I'm willing to bet you that that chair is in that photograph. I just don't know which one it is. Uh, the chair is actually broken. I can't sit on it, but that's good. I wouldn't want people to sit on it anyway. Uh, but um, it was given by a friend of mine when they knocked the building down in 1984. They knocked it down with all of the furniture in it. And, and so um, uh, a friend of mine got in there into the pile of rubble and pulled out a bunch of these chairs going, this is so sad that they're just scrapping all this stuff. So they did. So um, Brian says, looks like you've kept very good care of the chair. I, you know, I would agree with you until I noticed, however, it's covered in dust. <laughs> That's all somebody's going to say, Steve. <laughs> Shouldn't you dust it? Why well, don't dust anything else? Why should I dust that? But thank you. Uh, Charles Layton checking from Northeast Arkansas. Michael Soremikon, will the robot lady ever join a live stream? You know, I should ask her uh, whether she can check in or not. I will send her a quick text right now. Um, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> getting all these notes from people going, uh, why aren't you on the air? So I'm saying I am. I'm on the air now. Um, <laughs> I know it's not on the air, but that's what I call it. Doing a live now, period. People asking about you. And I just sent that to the Canadian robot lady. We'll see if she responds. Uh, you know, she, she might not. This is kind of short notice. 
<laughs> Johnny Knoxville says she'll probably show up in about five minutes. We'll see. We'll see. I know that she's in a different time zone than I am. She's also in a different country than I am because she, of course, is in Canada. So Hugo's Travels checking in from California. Thank you very much. Hello from Alaska. Bernadette Phillips. Uh, one of my best friends from high school is in Alaska. He's an attorney in Anchorage, and he spends a lot of time representing school districts, believe it or not. I uh, went to high school together, and then he went his way, and I went mine. But he's one of the people who talked me into studying the law. Uh, I was not sure about that, and he and I had some long discussions where he convinced me that it was something that I would probably enjoy doing. It turns out he was right. So good high school friend of mine. Uh, JLC730, hello from Michigan. Well, I'm in Michigan also, so thank you very much for checking in. Uh, but feel free to tell me where in Michigan you might be. Kurt's Corner is in Boulder. Uh, is this of Kurt and Laura fame? I'm curious. I know a Kurt and Laura in Colorado. Uh, Patrick Zuba, did construction speed cameras ever come to Michigan? I've not seen any, but I've heard they're coming because think of the children. Oh, wait, no. Think of the construction workers. <laughs> Terry Legros Basson. Hi, Steve. Terry, the gold prospector. Uh, I'd love to see your detector and any detecting stories. Um, the detector I have is a white V3i. It's the primary one I use. Uh, and I've never gone detecting for gold. I mainly look for old coins. But one of these days, I'll drag it out here and remember to bring it onto the set and show it to you during a live stream. Uh, Ko Samui, hello from Bangkok. Hello from Bangkok. That that might be the furthest away we're going to hear from today. Johnny Knoxville says, hey, the CRL might be watching hockey. <laughs> she does love her hockey, as do all Canadians. It's it's, it's part of their birthright. Um, Daniel Donnelly says, I'm now reading American Murder Houses. In your opinion, which is the grisliest murder in this compilation? And he's in upstate New York. Thank you for checking in. I've got a big announcement about that book next week. Just trust me on this one. It's a big announcement. But um, the Velisca Axe Murder House uh, was the site of the grisliest and, and most uh, gruesome, I believe, murder, uh, at least of the ones in that book. And uh, I won't ruin it for you, <laughs> but trust me, a lot of people getting axe murdered in their sleep adds up to a lot of gruesomeness. JLC730 says he's in the Kalamazoo area. Kalamazoo is one of those towns we love to say the name of. I think there's even a song called I Got a Gal in Kalamazoo because it's just so fun to say. Um, greetings from Canton, Michigan, TMOS70. Thank you for checking in. Canton's a little bit closer to Wayne County and Detroit than Kalamazoo is. Uh, Rich's Mowers and Blowers says, I'm in Michigan, Dundee, Michigan. I know where that is. Dundee, of course, is uh, right down about here or so. It's hard to be exactly, exactly accurate with the human hand. It's not, it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation. Johnny Knoxville is being generous today. Thank you very much for the content. Too good to be free. <laughs> that reminds me of Artie Lang's book, Too Fat to Fish. But uh, too good to be free is, is something I'll take it as well. Uh, William, sitting here waiting for your videos, but you're live now. Yeah, I'll have another video going up live at, uh, another video going up at 3 o'clock, which is why this is at 1 o'clock. And, and so I, forgive me for the late start. I did start a few minutes late. Gene Montgomery says, by accepting this donation, you consent to binding arbitration with squatters who drive Hertz rentals after their RV broke down in one week. And that is if they move onto your property and then the police show up and take everything you've got left through civil asset forfeiture. And by the way, the binding arbitration will be the rules that you pick. You get to pick the arbitrator, what language it's conducted in and what country it'll take place in. And it'll be conducted by the venue of your choice. Uh, and their you know, choice choice of laws situation. So there you go. <laughs> Gregory Fousey is checking from Benton Harbor. Can the court deny your evidence in a fraud upon the court case? It has no statute of limitations. Uh, that's a lot of questions. I'm not even sure what you're getting at there. So um, sorry, but I can't answer that based on that. It's just it's it's a hypothetical wrapped in a riddle surrounded by a confusing enigma. Derpy, CWC, Steve is live. Yes, I am. And Johnny Knoxville says, tip your bartender. <laughs> Except don't expect me to mix any drinks. I'd have a hard time pouring something into a glass straight. Um, Regis, in regards to that homeless victim of ID theft, how can he get satisfaction? Uh, he Well, he could sue the guy who did that and see what's within the statute of limitations. 
But he could also ask the government, the prosecutors, to make restitution part of the punishment for the crime. And they will often do that. You've heard of people being fined, for instance. So they can often make restitution part of the sentence. So it's the question whether the guy's got any money to pay it back. Jacob Lokers checking in from Manistee, Michigan. Not to be confused with Manistee. Manistee's in the UP. Manistee is, 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 up, is up over here uh, on, the, on the west coast of the lower peninsula. You got to remember that Michigan's got an eastern coast and a west coast and a lower peninsula and a southern coast and a northern coast and the upper peninsula. Chuck Whitehead is chipping in a dollar. I appreciate that very much. Almost feel like a stripper here getting ones. <laughs> the scooter guy. How do you decide between competing stories when any of them would be a great story? That's an interesting question because here's the thing. I get lots of stories sent to me. I also see stories. I, I, I come across stories. And I try to find the two best stories, the two best stories. What makes a story good so that one can be better than the other, okay? Um, and so I try to find the stories that I think are most interesting in what got my attention. But also, um, I do try to mix them up. But I also do pay attention to the stories that people liked in the past. So obviously, people tend to respond better to, better to stories about like government overreach than they do about like, you know, uh, class action involving whether or not the ingredients in grape uh, jam is actually grape, you know, that kind of thing. And so, but, but it's, yeah, there's, there's no science to it. Uh, as you can tell by the popularity of my videos going up and down, <laughs> if I can make them all home runs, I would. So, you know, it's kind of like asking a batter, you go up the plate, how do you decide whether you're going to hit a single, a double, a triple, or a home run? No, no, no. I just hit the ball and run like an, like a woodchuck. <laughs> Four, nine, five, three has the woodchuck returned. No, he is not as far as I can tell. But I was walking my property earlier today and I, and I went around, there's a berm I've got, and there's little footprints all around it, all around it. And, and um, the footprints looks like woodchuck footprints. But I don't mind because the berm is far enough away from my house. If he lives out there, I'm fine. I just don't want to cohabit with him <laughs> or co-garage with him either. Dougie Dew says, hey, there's an eclipse tomorrow. I've, I've heard that. I've heard that. Um, Georgiana says, I was watching your morning video when this came up. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and, and the, the sad part is I just, I just, <laughs> I just interfered with myself. I just stepped on myself because now I'm, I'm not getting the view over there. I, 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 I'm getting the view over here. Chuck Whitehead, how do you determine if the story is fake before you post it? Uh, if a story looks, uh, unreasonably, uh, unusual, I will double check it against other sources and I've had a couple where somebody sends me a story and says, Steve, check this story out. And I, and I look at it and go, I don't know if that's real or not. And then I, I'll do a Google search and it doesn't pop up any place but that one source. Then I'm real skeptical. I had somebody send me an onion story or it may have been a Babylon Bee story last week that they thought was real. And they actually said, Steve, this is the craziest story ever. And I read the bottom and I go, this is a, this is a satire. This is not a real story. And they're like, oops, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. The sad part is like when you're reading an onion story by the end, you should realize it's the onion. But once in a while, they're written right in that borderline thing. So it's hard to say. Uh, Stephen Lockie says the woodchuck strikes back would be episode two and episode three would be revenge of the woodchuck. There'd probably also be a series just Chucky. <laughs> That's what they call them. So Brian Douglas, no eclipse in Bahrain. That's one of those things that really, uh, it doesn't bother me, but you have to be aware of the fact that they'll tell you uh, that this is the last chance to see an eclipse of this sort for 45 years. And the next year's another one. The last chance to see an eclipse of this sort for 35 years. And you're like, well, wait, what about the one last year? And it turns out they're talking about whether it's full totality or whether or not it goes across this portion of the U.S. or that portion of the U.S. And, you know, because, I mean, I've heard of other eclipses in my lifetime. They're not once-in-a-lifetime things, in, unless you're getting into those distinctions, which reminds me of somebody who goes, I've got this muscle car. It's one of one. And they go, oh, what is that? And they go, it's the only 1970 uh, Plymouth Barracuda 
with a 383, a four speed, uh, a rack on the deck lid of, of the trunk, uh, and, and a purple interior, and an AM but no FM radio. And I'm like, but those are things nobody cares about, okay? <laughs> I'd rather see the one of seven Hemi Cuda convertibles of that one year, you know, that kind of thing. But when you have to make up a whole category to become one of one or whatever, it's like, yeah, I don't know about that. Gail Watson, happy Sunday. I always recognize Gail. She's got the little thumbnail there. I believe it's of a smiling dog's face. The question, of course, is do dogs smile? I'm not really sure. But uh, Dan Boyd says he had a mod top. That's one of those weird options that was available in the Mopars. I understand that taste is one of those things you can't really argue about. But uh, there was a couple things that, that Chrysler did in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I'm sorry, uh, late 60s, early 70s, more so, where they had weird patterns that you could get on the convertible, not the convertible, but the vinyl tops. Some of them are hideous. And so nobody ordered them. Now they're rare. Yeah, they were rare because they're ugly. Um, the Prodigal Strangers is checking in from Wayne, New Jersey. Glad to catch you live and glad you like the flight of the Sisu. Yeah, it turns out there was a, a sailplane called the Sisu that set all kinds of records. And uh, Prodigal Strangers sent me a note and some photographs, I think, from the Smithsonian about it. I'd never heard of it. Of course, Sisu is also the name of the movie that came out recently. It's uh, got a little bit of violence in it, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Just talking about it yesterday. Uh, but yeah, if you can get a chance to catch the movie Sisu, uh, it's an action film. Uh, and it's it's set entirely, and most of the actors are from Finland. And uh, it's, it's in my mind, it's a great movie because it, it demonstrates, among other things, <laughs> what happens when there's an angry Finn that you don't leave alone. <laughs> Oh, boy. Emmanuel says, my afternoons, I'm lost when you don't post two videos a day. I wander lonely when I don't see a second uh, one post. I've got Steve's books to fill the lonely afternoons. I appreciate that. And by the way, I've been asked about that recently, where people say, Steve, I noticed that you did not post a second video on Thursday or whatever. And if a video of mine is doing really, really well, uh, and I know that some people are going to say this is not something I should be considering, but I do. And that is that if, if I put up a video that's doing really, really well, and I put in a second video while the first one's still doing really well, it'll actually cut into the performance of the first video. And you can see the first video, go, eh, er, and the second video starts here. But if I push it back a little bit, the first video does so well, and I kind of hate to interrupt a, a well-performing video. So it's, it's, it's most days I put up two videos. Like I said, there's gonna go one, one's going to go up at 3 o'clock. How do I know that? Because the first video's not doing that well. <laughs> it's not doing so well. Let's put it that way. So um, JLC730 says, I have a lakefront land in the UP in Skaney. Wondering why if property taxes go up based on whether a structure is put on wheels. I've gotten conflicting opinions. I don't know that much about what drives property valuations in the state of Michigan. I should know more, but I don't. Skaney, however, I do know. Skaney is on the eastern side of the Kuna Bay, which is near Lance. So if you're driving to the Upper Peninsula and you go through Lons, if you hang a left and go around the bottom of the bay up to Copper Harbor, one of my favorite places on earth, you would instead turn right through Lons and go up the other side of the bay. And you can go, for instance, the town of Pequaming, but there's Skaney out there. It's just, it's a very cool, desolate area. A lot of woods, a lot of lakes and rivers, and obviously being so close to Lake Superior too. But um, I've heard different things, but you have to understand that also a lot of the tax rates are based on appraisals done by locals. And I've heard people say that I've got a piece of property and it, it never goes up in what they'd value it at. And other people say, no, I'm over here. And there they go crazy as often as they can, you know? So um, Joel says, how does one go about trying to submit an opinion piece to Jalopnik or another car publication? I want to call out Mercedes parts problem supplies, six months on some parts. Uh, what I would suggest to you to do is my good friend, David Tracy, along with Jason Torchinsky, right, uh, started a site called The Autopian. And they put up a lot of written stuff, and they're always looking for good material. So write to David Tracy. You'll find his website on The Autopian. You'll find his email there. Go to the website and say, hey, uh, David, uh, Steve Leto mentioned that if I wrote to you very nicely, you'd consider a piece I wrote. And you, you, you can blame me. <laughs> Johnny Knoxville says, time the market. <laughs> If you're talking about the market on YouTube, it's kind of hard to guess. So, 
Bill Van Ram, you still enjoying your Viper? Or are you thinking what's next? Uh, well, I've got the Cobra. That's what's next. But I, I still like the Viper a lot. I like both cars a lot. I'm not getting rid of one. Uh, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on to it and, and uh, keep it alongside my Cobra. Uh, if nothing else, it's places for woodchucks to nest. Uh, Swiss, Swisted Films, have you ever gotten water in your gasoline? Not in my car. No, I've never have. Now, I, I've mentioned before that I've dealt with gas stations that did. I've sued a gas station where a client of mine got a tank load of water, um, and it can be very damaging. Uh, if you catch it soon enough, you can limit the damage, but it's still a pain in the rear to get it out of your system. But, uh, yeah, water and gasoline can be a real problem. Chuck Whitehead, have you ever attended NASCAR races there near Detroit? Um, I'm not sure of the NASCAR races near Detroit these days. Now, little known fact, some of the earliest years of NASCAR, they did races all over the place. And so in the 1950s, I believe, there were races at the Detroit fairgrounds. The fairgrounds in Detroit actually had NASCAR-sanctioned races on the dirt. And they're hilarious to read about because it's largely a bunch of unknowns racing, but huge audiences because of Detroit. And NASCAR was still such a young thing at that time. So uh it, it was crazy but I'm, I'm not sure where the nearest nascar race is to me other than like mis for instance which is a, quite a hike from detroit but um i've been by there but i've not been to a nascar race there dougie do will there ever be a ski blade to the garage along the lines of what jay leno has going you mean with a huge garage full of cars <laughs> no uh i think at most I'm going to have three cars other than my daily drivers. And I have not picked what the third car is yet. So we'll see what happens. Um, B. Demon says, cars named after snakes. Interesting. And by the way, B, I used one of your stories today. I can't remember if it's gone up yet or not, but I did. Uh, yeah, the Cobra and the Viper. And there is a connection, of course, because uh, Carol Shelby has connections to both the Cobra and the Viper. And, and he apparently had a fascination with snakes. <laughs> The Hamburglar, have you ever considered doing a video just on general legal questions and the answers? Uh, can a public defender reject a client if they're 100% guilty? Um, well, and he gives the example of the guy that jumped the judge on video. Uh, there's like four things I can address here, one of which is I have occasionally done videos on just legal topics. In fact, I shot one this morning. They'll go up tomorrow, I think, on uh, what constitutes a legal signature. It was not based on a news story. It's just simply based on something that occurred to me. However, um, public defenders can turn down work. Uh, and the interesting thing, though, is they wouldn't turn it down because the guy's guilty. They'd more likely turn it down because if the guy says, by the way, to defend myself, I'm going to commit perjury. That's a problem. But where the guy jumped the judge in front of his attorney, the attorney's got the easiest out in the world. He can say, I'm a, I'm a witness now. I cannot represent you because I'm a witness. Therefore, I'm out. So there you go. Um, Charles Layton says he had water in the gas from the pump and it sucks. It, it happened last year to him. Yeah, and obviously um, it, it can be very expensive too. Cornstalker, what you were, what, what years were you at WLEW? 1982 and 83. And by the way, I recently decided it was time to take the collection of tapes I've got. I've got literally, watch this. I've got cases of cassettes, and that is simply one box of cassettes. And I've got five or 10 of those, and they're all cassettes from back when I was on the radio. And of course, now cassettes, um, I still have a cassette player in one of my trucks, but <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not that good of a cassette uh, player, but I'm now converting them to MP3s. And so I've got a, I've got a little uh, thing set up over here with an MP3 converter, and I'm converting them one at a time, but they convert in real time. I'm not going to do the thing where I high-speed double them and try. So I'm literally doing them one at a time. And so I've gotten five or ten done now. <laughs> but I came across some uh, tapes from WLEW the other day, and I was listening to them going, oh, Ooh, I know you got to start somewhere, but man, where you started. <laughs> I'm trying, talking about how how how... I sounded on the radio, uh, not terribly good. So, 
Uh, have you seen Japan's legal, uh, strange legal system? Ask somebody with a Japanese um, signature. I don't know that much about it. My understanding is that it's 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 um, a little harsher than ours, but I also understand that um, uh, some of the crime rates are lower in Japan, and it might be a direct relationship between how harsh these uh, the, the process is and how much you want to stay out of it. But I could be completely wrong on that, and I apologize, so I don't know. For the two, TWO, hey, caught you live. Thank you. James Farmer, no 8-track? You know, I don't think I've ever owned a vehicle with an 8-track. Uh, I remember my brother had a Le Mans with an 8-track in it. But no, no, I've never, I've never, now I've had some 8-tracks. In fact, talking about 8-tracks, I had people send them in to me. I've got a couple 8-tracks, I think, on the shelves in my, in my studio. But they may have been moved out of view. I'm not sure. Um, Sunflower says, I remember a video when you talk about being harassed by police while eating pizza outside. You said something to the effect that you weren't teenage skateboarders. I thought it was strange. I'm guessing you're going to say strange that I would, I would compare uh, people that deserve hassling to teenage skateboarders. I wasn't saying that teenage skateboarders deserve to be hassled because, among other things, I was a teenage skateboarder. I, I had a skateboard when I was in junior high school, and I still have it, by the way. Uh, but I can tell you right now that I've known areas where if there's a bunch of kids standing around on skateboards, the cops will show up like magic and go, hey, what are you guys doing? So, you know, um, but but I was not picking on skateboarders because I myself am a skateboarder. And if you don't believe me, remind me. Next week, I'm going to bring out here. What did I say? I was going to bring something else out to show it to you. I'm a metal detector. I'll bring my metal detector out and I'll bring my skateboard out. <laughs> Next week's going to be show and tell. <laughs> and I'm going to bring those things out and show them to you. Just to show you, not picking on skateboarders. Alphabetized Steve, the $30 million guard of heist is absolutely fascinating. Uh, yeah. And, and I, like I said before, I'm always baffled by these things because quite often they solve them very, very quickly. And so it's kind of hard if, if you've got inside information for you to get away with it because um, um, they can usually figure out where the inside information came from. Terry LeGros Bisson, have you ever heard of the Australian band Angel City? I'm not sure. That one's ringing a faint bell, but I know it's an American band called Angel. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember. I wish I could do research while I'm talking, but then I know it would distract me, so I'm not going to. But um, For the Two says you should do a members-only channel with content. You know, I'm torn about that. I could do that. But my concern is that if people start paying directly for the content, then I'd have a hard time still just doing what I do, you know, goofing off as, as I feel is appropriate. What happened to the Tucker? Asks the condo in Redondo. Why is the turbine car where the Tucker used to be? Get your Navitimer cleaned and calibrated. Hey, hey, <laughs> I wear it every day. If I had sent it out for cleaning and calibration, it'd probably uh, uh, take a while. And I don't know what I'd wear in the meantime. The Tucker got moved because a Cobra joined the set. The Tucker is actually right there on that shelf, visible in this shot. Uh, it's nothing against the Tucker. I wrote a book about the Tucker. I love Tuckers. I've seen, I've seen probably more than half of them by now. Um, but the, um, the Tucker got, in essence, rotated out because the Cobra got rotated in. I have a Cobra. So on the shelf, you have me, I got a Cobra and a Viper because those are, are, are two of the cars that I actually own. Alphabetizes points out that two of us can keep a secret as long as one of us is dead. That is, that is an old saying and quite true. And usually it's because they, they can just figure it out and they go, okay, how many people knew the layout of the place? How many people knew where this one thing was? And then you go, okay, let's just go over a list of who works here now, who used to work here. They start questioning people. And before you know it, some guy, you know, snaps because you're like, okay, I don't want to go down for this one. Eight other people are involved. So, ah, Tequila Afra says, turban car, L-O-L. -L. You misspelled it. Uh, T-U-R-B-I-N-E, turban. Uh, the word has two different pronunciations. And I don't know if you're joking or not, but it's, it's, it's getting really old on this channel. Michael Horsley says, I saw you on Vin Wiki. Yeah, I've been on Vin Wiki 11 times. Jilly Jill, greetings from Bama. I love seeing all the old license plates that you showcase. Yeah, um, and I and again, I got a stack of those too. I'm rotating through those, and I have some people go, "Hey, what happened to this one? What happened to that one?" 
And I apologize. I, I rotate them through them as, as often as I can. So Tom says, what about a third-party cleaning company? It's a common security vulnerability. That's always a possibility. They've got to keep track of every single person that goes into and out of that building. They, they, they've got to. So Johnny Knoxville says, uh, Steve-O once said, I had a threesome this weekend, but two no-shows. <laughs> Toby Kenobi is $100 still bill still hiding on the set. Yes, but you can't see it from this angle because it's on that set there. I'm getting better at this. It's on that set, which is facing my main camera over there. Sassy Pants says, I never got my questions answered. Well, that's not a question. That's a statement. <laughs> Standard deviations. I've seen Leno's turbine car at Calabasas Car Meet in California. He brought it to car shows. Now, I can tell you right now it's in Michigan because its engine is being repaired. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he used to drive the thing from time to time and just took it places, you know, like all his other cars. Johnny Knoxville says, I'd buy that for a dollar. And that's a famous quote from RoboCop. And uh, RoboCop actually has got quite a bit of violence in it also. Uh, probably a little more than Sisu. But um, I'd buy that for a dollar is actually one of the goofiest, funniest sayings. I've always loved, <laughs> loved that line from that movie. Uh, the booze king asks is it a lawful order if a police officer tells you to stand on one leg while rubbing your belly and patting your head as long as it's in the interest of public uh, in the interest of officer safety no but it would be lawful if it was part of a sobriety test <laughs> the sad part is that there's no bright line on what constitutes officer safety as you'd like there to be and i'm referring to everybody and if they said these things are officer safety, well, anything they left out wouldn't be. So Mr. Landfill says, were you on Flint Radio as part of the Buffalo Dick and a sidekick Buffalo Chip radio show? No, but I worked at that radio station a few years later. Uh, that was WWCK FM 105 in Flint. They changed formats in early 1989. And I went to work there after they changed formats to become the CK 105. Uh, but that radio show is famous. So G Keyman, five six five, another live. Steve Lato, indeed. Thank you. It's good to see you, my friend. Elmshorn boy, Sir Lato. What was the most hard situation on job to accept as a lawyer? Um, well, as a private attorney, I get to turn down work I don't want. Uh, but I can tell you that for a while, for a while, I did do uh, public defender work for a couple different courts, and that got tough because they'd say, here, this is your new client. Go meet your client and take care of them. And a couple of times there were cases I would not have accepted if there were simply people calling me out of the blue and I, and I, and I handled their cases, but I did a good job for them, but it's more fun doing cases that you can really get into. And I enjoy car cases much, much more so. Um, my new username 47 I had a friend who always watched and never failed to my knowledge to find the 100. There are one or two people who will jump on and instantly spot the 100. And the other day, I accidentally put it so it was underneath my left elbow, blocked by my body when I was sitting. But every now and then, if I moved my arm just right, you could just catch a corner of it. And I felt so bad about doing that that I actually blew the screen up and put it as an end screen so you could see where it was. And within one minute of going up, three people spotted it. I'm like, they're, they're looking through me somehow. I didn't know it was possible. I didn't know it was possible, but it turns out that people spotted it. So um, Johnny Knoxville says, I had to use the Legal Aid Society in another life, and they really did me a solid with unemployment appeals. You know, it's unfortunate a lot of people um, – rip on public defenders, not based on their experience, but based on them doing the logical pr thought process of going, well, if they're paid by the court, then obviously they're working for the court. And I can tell you right now, I've seen some public defenders do some amazing jobs and they're not paid by the court in that sense. They're actually paid by the state. But anyway, uh, you don't have to believe me. Um, Mike Repair Stuff says, I really enjoy and learn from your videos, your wife's Meditation ads are priceless. Uh, thank you, but she's not my wife. Uh, but but a lot of people guess that, and um, I, I'm I'm 
I've pointed out in many videos, including the 10 year anniversary video I put out a week ago, that she's just a friend of mine. She lives in Canada. I've never actually met her face to face, which is the irony of modern technology. Uh, but we've we've spoken, we've talked on the phone. I texted her as we started the show here, although she's not texted me back, nor has she joined us, I don't think. Um, no, but um, she's just a good friend of mine. And we met online because she started watching my videos and she heard me mentioning radio. And she has a very, very similar radio background as I do. Roughly the same age, got into radio about the same time, worked the same kind of stations. And so we had had some great conversations just talking about talking about uh you know funny experiences in radio even though she was in canadian radio is very very similar to working in uh american radio rubius ru asks are field sobriety tests unique to the usa why don't they use handheld breath tests like in the uk uh the field sobriety test is to see whether or not you should be then asked to do the breathalyzer the portable roadside one um and of course, if you watch the movie, The Man of Two Brains, you know that there are other countries where they have extremely difficult field sobriety tests. But in Michigan, uh, in, in America, it varies from state to state. Uh, but in America, they cannot pull you over and just demand that you do the PBT right away. They're supposed to try to determine whether or not it's appropriate. And it's a whole constitutional issue thing. So... Nate Fish says, I've been watching Judge Middleton, who's from Michigan, and the legal aid attorney, Meg, always does seem to do professional and, and is helpful. Um, I've, I've seen her once or twice, and I've seen a bunch of the different uh, people who pop up there from time to time. So Johnny Knoxville says, in Canadian bars, I've seen self-breathalyzer machines. You put a dollar in and check your BAC. Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea to have. have a, in fact, they should have a game. And the question is whether you win by going too high or too low. <laughs> so I used to do a whole bunch of uh, drunk driving cases. I've, I've, early in my career, uh, I, I represented a couple of people on drunk driving cases and, and word got out. And so it was always friends of friends of mine. And I wound up doing a whole raft of them. And I don't do that many of those uh, kind of cases anymore, but I used to quite a bit. Mike and Bikes just noticed that I'm in a different studio, but it's actually just a different angle of the main studio. And that's true. Why do you change your license plates? Because I have too many. <laughs> Daniel asks, can I travel with $1,000 of cash domestically? Legally, yes. Can they take it? Yes, they will take it. They, I've seen them seize less than that. If they pull you over and you've got 500 bucks in cash on you and they decide to declare it as criminal proceeds, they'll take it from you. They will. And they'll say, sue us to get it back. And of course, it will not be worth it financially to sue them to get it back. But that's one of the reasons why they're doing that. The scooter guy, have you considered collaborative videos with other YouTube lawyers? Uh, I have. I've done a couple. Uh, I did one with Mike, the guy out of Chicago. Um, I, I forgot the exact name of his channel. Uh, that was a lot of fun. He's a nice guy. Um, but I don't do a lot of collaborations primarily because um, I don't have the setup for it. Um, and I, I just, I just, <laughs> oh boy, it's teaching an old dog new tricks. Hey, Steve from El Paso. It's J, just the letter J. Mrs. Hayes, first name purple, I'm guessing. Steve, do you like any other YouTuber lawyers? Um, there's a couple I watch, but I try not to watch any videos or channels that would be similar to what I do because I don't want ever to even accidentally start doing something that I was inspired by watching someone else. But I love the lock picking lawyer, but that's not a law show. It's a, it's a lock picking show. <laughs> the guy's a genius. It's the greatest thing ever. I mean, the guy's got a specialized knowledge in a real narrow field and he's really, really good at it. And then he does these great, great videos about lock picking. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up lock picking lawyer and you'll be mesmerized. And all you're gonna see is the guy's hands. Yeah, Law Talk with Mike, MG Mustang 05 points out, and that is who I'm talking about. Yeah. So um, the tribes is more interviews, like with Rossman. Yeah, I did a, I did a, um, I did a, I, 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 I appeared on his show, on Lewis Rossman's show a while back, talking about right to repair in the Magnus Moss Warranty Act. I've done a few other things like that, but um, it's usually, uh, where somebody comes along 
and and says, hey, Steve, you want to be on my show? And I look to see how many followers they've got. <laughs> Gail watches the lock taking lawyer too. Artful Dodgers says, please do a video on no fault insurance. Oh my God. Uh, Michigan's got no fault insurance. And so do a few other states, but Michigan's is so bizarre. It's just, it's just the weirdest thing, but it, it hurts me. It hurts me to think about. Mike and Bikes' lock picking lawyer could have been who broke into the $30 million vault in LA. <laughs> Mrs. Hayes' lock picking lawyer is the awesome content I never knew I wanted. That's the thing about YouTube. Okay. And I understand there's other channels out there, other sites that have videos on them and so on. But you have to understand something. There's stuff out there that you didn't know existed. And then you see it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing I ever saw. And so I'm going to tell you right now that there is a, 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 one of my favorite, like you said, Steve, name your five favorite videos on YouTube. Five. You got five. You got to pick one through five. One of them, it might not be the number one video, but your top five, is there is a, a French kid, but he's grown up now, whose name is Matt Rash. I could be mispronouncing that because it's French, but M-A-T-T-R-A-C-H. And, um, or it could be R-A-C-H-E. But anyways, M-A-T-T-R-A-C-H, Matt Rash. And he plays the guitar. And as a teenager, he pulled out a camera, playing along with a musical track of Paco Bell's Canon, and it's all part of a meme. Don't worry about that. He plays a lead guitar over that. And he's like 13 years old. It blows your mind when you see it. It's this kid in his bedroom playing the guitar unlike anything you've ever seen. I sent it to my friends who are guitar players. I've got, I know people who are guitar players. I've shown it to them. I've actually had people go, wait, 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 wait. Oh my gosh, that's real. Like it, it's, and he looks so young and he's doing so well. And the thing's got tens of millions of views. And he wound up getting endorsement deals from Fender. He wound up making a channel where all he does is he does these musical covers. They're, they're instrumental covers of hit songs. But he's just doing the, the, instead of a vocal, he's doing the guitar. And it's, the channel is so cool. And it all started with that one video. And I remember the first time I saw it, it's not even shot very well. I don't know if it's shot with a cell phone or what it's shot with. But it's grainy. It's but it's real, and it's this kid just just shredding in a way that blows your mind. And I know people go, "Oh, come on, Steve, Steve, come on, right, you know you don't play the guitar." No, 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 no. I've had guitar players watch and go, "Oh my God, this guy's this kid's good." So, um, Extreme Shaft, do you know of any updates on the Chrysler salesperson selling employee discount codes back from 2021? No, I don't, but that's something that happens from time to time. And you often hear about things like that, where if you go into a dealership and it's slow and they're not selling as many cars as they like, they go, hey, if I got you an employee discount, would you buy one? And somebody go, yeah. And so what they'll do then is they'll go dig through their deal folders from past deals and they'll find somebody who got an employee discount. And then using that information, get a discount code for somebody who doesn't deserve it. And a lot of times people will get the discount and not tell anybody, you know, but some people will. So somebody points out that the sound is behind the video and I apologize, but there's absolutely nothing I can do about that. The only thing I can do is talk into this thing and look at that thing and read over here. So I apologize. If it gets so bad that we can't watch, I'll just shut it off. I mean, so that's, that's really the only question here is do we keep going or not? I'm going to plow ahead though. So um the scooter guy points out that sync issues are youtube not my fault thank you oh and johnny knoxville says yeah and of course you're a fan of rick beato rick beato is uh one of the guys that i respect the most in this world because he likewise he's a musician who runs a recording studio i think in georgia but he can explain music both in ways that musicians will go wow this guy's good but the people like me who know nothing about music will go wow this guy's good and the stuff he talks about, both about just music in general, he'll he'll take a song and go, here's why this song is good. And he'll break it down. Or you'll, you may have heard a song a million times. He'll break it down and point out things that you didn't know were in there. But he also knows the music business, record business, the live performing business. I mean, the stuff he talks about. And he's one of the few people that I watch almost every 
video he puts up, I will watch. Rick Beato, B-E-A-T-O. Um, take America back, says Mr. Plow, Homer Simpson. <laughs> Mr. Plow, that's the name. That name again is Mr. Plow. I'm not quite sure what that's apropos of, but it's apropos of everything as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, and Swiston Films got that too. That name again is Mr. Plow. Mrs. Hayes likes uh, Beato's, uh, Rick Beato as well. Gary Fleshner, Rick Beato is such a treasure. Johnny Knoxville nominates We Built This City as the worst song of all time. You got to qualify that as a bit uh, as saying the worst song to ever be a hit of all time, because, you know, they're bad songs that never make it on the radio. But We Built This City is one of those annoying songs. It's just it's annoying. And of course, there are different variations of it for different cities. And and uh, yeah, I never I was not a big fan. I was not a big fan. Yeah. And Mike Lilly says and the guests he gets Rick Beato has gotten so big now that he gets to have people on a show like Sting. Now, don't get me wrong. You might not like Sting, but he. He's a star. <laughs> I couldn't get Sting on my show. <sighs> Kokomo is the worst, says Django Apple. Kokomo, little known fact, of course, we're talking about, I'm assuming it was spelled with K's instead of C's, the uh, Beach Boys song. And it was, believe, or, uh, believe it or not, it was written by the guy from the Mamas and the Papas. I think John Phillips wrote that song, which is really strange that the Beach Boys had a hit with somebody else's written song. But then again, the song, I Write the Songs, that was done by Barry Manilow, was written by Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys. So none of this has to line up that way, but it's 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 true. Earthbound Misfits is Mickey by Tony Basil. Now, Miss uh, Mickey is one of those songs that's annoying after you've heard it about a thousand times. But the first time you heard it, you got to admit, you go, that's catchy. That's catchy. The second time you're going, hmm. The third time you're going, okay, I got to punch somebody now. <laughs> I worked in radio and that song was on the charts and I had to play it. Free the Birds says, what about my ding by uh by by Chuck Berry? Interestingly, I think that was the biggest hit he ever had. Um, so uh, I, I got mixed feelings. I like Chuck, but um Reinerd Man says, I secretly hate we built the city. Why why keep it a secret? <laughs> We're all friends here. He just come right out. Johnny Knoxville says Rick Beato's Why Apple is Crap is a great video on how I discovered him. Yeah, he has opinions too. Um, <laughs> he put out one recently about uh, what's destroyed the music industry. And they make a very good case about all the things that have happened that have destroyed the industry, including a lot of things that you might not be aware of or hadn't really put together, but he puts it all together like a big jigsaw puzzle. So. Earthbound Misfits is anything but Eiffel 65. Did they put out anything beyond that one song? Is the song called Blue? Blah, blah, blee, blah, blah, blue. <laughs> I think they're from France. And I don't mean to insult an entire country. But quick, name five hit records in America by French bands. Because um, I think the correct answer there is zero. Um, Dan Boyd's Rick D's did Disco Duck. Disco Duck, by the way. Rick Dees, everybody in California knows him, of course. He was a longtime disc jockey on KISS FM in Los Angeles. He worked in Memphis, WHBQ, long, long before that. Uh, but he did the song Disco Duck, and Disco Duck was a surprise hit. Um, and a little-known fact is that the surprise hit Disco Duck was on the charts at the exact same time, I believe, as the, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So you can look at the charts from that time period and go, oh, Disco Duck and the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, literally like as, as, as wide of a spectrum as you can possibly get. Uh, Lettuce Salad says, I'm going to be by the Proclaimers, the 500 Miles song. That's another one that I think that um, for some odd reason it reminds me of Chumba Wumba by Tub Thumping. But <laughs> a Tub Thumping by Chumba Wumba. But, but at least... That song is catchy again, and if it's catchy enough for you to remember it, then there's something going on. Too much sugar. What's your favorite topic to cover in your channel? Um, I still like talking about civil asset forfeiture because it's something we all need to talk about until it goes away. Ted McElway, Dr. Demento was the greatest of all time. He was a genius. He figured out early on he collected weird records and he'd play them for people and they'd go, wow, that's cool. I could do a radio show based on this. And he'd often have a radio show, it'd be syndicated. It would be like Saturday night or Sunday night sometime. 
uh, on some FM station in the evening. And people would tune in to hear the weird stuff. And of course, he's credited with discovering Weird Al. And another one rides the bus. We talked about that before. Uh, Madcap57, why do you avoid controversial topics? Uh, it depends on what you consider controversial, but quite often I won't talk politics, for instance, because number one, I'm not going to change anybody's mind and all I'll do is alienate half my audience. And the other half won't appreciate that I just lost the other half to make them happy. <laughs> Johnny Knoxville says Howard the Duck was a terrible movie. You know, I don't think I ever saw the entire thing. I, I don't know if it's watchable. I've, I've tried watching it. And it's one of those situations where somebody put a movie together and somehow no one who was involved in it realized how bad the movie was. Uh, Ed Libertor says, as a DJ, what song for you was okay until it was over? Uh, so it was overplayed. You ended up hating it. Oh, there's a bunch of songs, bunch of songs. I mean, I actually had to play uh, Stairway to Heaven once or twice. And that's a song that, don't get me wrong, it's a masterpiece on some level. But um, on the other hand, um, do we need to hear it again and again and again? So uh, classic rock was an interesting concept when they started it. But now most classic rock stations have a very, very tight playlist as well. Todd Watkins, I sent you an article at the Atlas address. Did you get them? Probably. I check my mail there every few days. Not every day, but every few days. Uh, but if you sent me something there, I most likely did get it. Um, Jerry C., Art Bell was always a trip to listen to. I will admit, I did not listen a lot to Art Bell, but I respect Art Bell for one reason. And that was that Art Bell, his philosophy was, I don't care what it is that you want to talk about. I don't care what you believe in. I'm going to let you have airtime like anybody else. And so the next thing you know is people calling in about being abducted by aliens and conspiracies and alien conspiracies and uh, alien conspiracy autopsies. And, and, but he's like, no, I, I'm not going to ridicule you or argue with you. I am going to discuss it with you and take you seriously. And I have a lot of respect for that. I know that a lot of people... Would would give him grief about that. Going, why do you why do you let these people come on and talk? He's like, I find them fascinating. And guess what? So did everybody else. <laughs> so, Donald Westerdale says, "Sugar, Sugar" by the Archies, number one song I believe from 1969. Uh, and of course, the Archies weren't a real band; they were one of those studio bands. Um, I'm drawing a mental blank on the lead singer's name, but he was in a bunch of different fake bands like that. Uh, but "Sugar, Sugar" again was a was a Cool song, interesting. I, I worked at two different oldies stations where I had to play it from time to time. I could I could play it once in a while, but yeah, it does kind of get to be a little annoying after a while. Paul Couture, wondering what software do you use for uploading? Well, for editing, I use Adobe Premiere, and then I just use the program for YouTube that uploads. I don't have any automated uploading software or anything like that. Django Apple says, my dingling by Chuck Berry. Somebody else mentioned that also. Russell Starr says the final countdown. Now, I'm going to tell you something about that song. Here's the problem. The final countdown is one of those songs where they feel it's necessary to play it at certain things. You'll hear it at sporting events. You'll hear it at like high school rallies. You'll hear it like anytime somebody's coming out. Like, and, and, and it's almost like the Rocky theme. And it's been so overplayed in those instances that most people have really only heard the beginning of the song like a million times and the full song much less than that. And so unfortunately it's overplayed and it's largely because of the situations which they feel the need to play it. Like I'm convinced right now that the song Celebrate by Cool and the Gang gets played more at wedding receptions than any place else, including radio stations in the world today. Aaron York says, you may want to consider DaVinci Resolve over Adobe Premiere for video editing. Uh, I'm not sure why. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I've been using Adobe Premiere now for like three years. I like it a lot. I've gotten used to it. I've learned how to use it. And so if I was to scrap that and start over, uh, probably a learning curve that would hurt everyone who watches my videos. Earthbound Misfit says, Baby Shark. <laughs> I've heard a lot of references to that, but I, I'm not sure that I've heard it. I know that um, there's an interesting phenomenon when people have children and they're raising young children and they suddenly become exposed to everything that's aimed at little kids. They have a different world experience than those who don't. <laughs> so, Blessed Life says, hi, Steve, love your reports. Maybe you should become a news anchor. 
Uh, you know something? I've, I've never worked in television in that way. Uh, I'm not sure they'd have me. I'm, I'm, I'm actually out of the age. I'm in the wrong age bracket now. I'm too old. Um, and also, they don't pay very well at television anymore. They don't. So standard deviation. If it ain't broke, we can fix it. <laughs> Ponzi. Freebird. The song I don't need to hear again. Okay. Freebird reminds me of a certain time frame. And by the way, the prodigal stranger says, don't stop believing by journey. Exact same time frame. So I, I've mentioned before, you guys know roughly how old I am, right? I'm between the ages of 45 and 75. <laughs> so there's Ario Speedwagon, Leonard Skinner, Cheap Trick, and Journey. All had big albums at the end of the 70s and the early 80s. That's all you heard on album rock. It was just, oh my God, Live at Budokan by Cheap Trick. I want you to want me. Oh my, huh? Like, <laughs> and Freebird was one of the songs that they played just over and over. And, oh my gosh. It, it, it brings back mad, bad memories. Um, so Paul Bridgers, hi Steve. Do you know what the big tubes behind your other desk? I have one. I've got a bunch of big tubes back here, both on the shelf way back there and on the shelf behind me when I'm on the air. They're radio tubes, I believe. Uh, Zafar, Syed, how does someone submit stories or articles to you? You can email them to me, uh, which is how most people do that. And I will type this out for you. Steve at, and I'll make sure I spelled it correct before I hit send. And there you go. Email me, steve at latoslaw.com. And uh, please do not send me video links. I do not watch them. I have people who send me video links. Go, Steve, watch this video. I can't. I get, I get so many, even though I keep saying don't send them to me. I get so many that if I watch them all, I'd have nothing to do all day long except watch videos. I couldn't even sleep, okay? I, I, I no other time. So, uh, and NetFiend says every other song was REO on the radio. Yeah, REO Speedwagon was one of them. And then Super Tramp's Breakfast in America, which, by the way, I liked the album, okay? It's just they just got overplayed, overplayed, overplayed. And Burning Sensations is talking about AOR Radio. And again, I mentioned this last week. There's a song by a band called The Burning Sensations called Belly of the Whale. KROQ Los Angeles played it. I think MTV may have played it also. It is a fantastic song. I know nothing about the band. I think they're from LA, but it's one of those things that got no airplay anywhere else. Great, great song. Love that song. <sighs> Supplanter Afternoon Delight. <laughs> the Simpsons even made fun of that one. I remember when that song came out, I actually kind of liked it at first, once or twice. And then after a while, but you have to remember, it came out at a time where they had to use euphemism for everything. So, you know, when you're, when, you, when, you're, when you're alone with your significant other in the afternoon, but not evening, uh, you can say, yeah, afternoon delight. You can't say what you actually did because that was uh, back when we were still trying to be clean on the radio. Pekka asks, are there still AM stations? Yeah, there are, but they're having a really hard time being relevant. Many of them survived by going all news talk or talk, but carrying all the biggest talkers out there. And even then, some of them are struggling financially. So Harvey Wiseman, Billy Joel, scenes from an Italian restaurant. Um, I always feel bad saying this because I don't want to criticize anybody else's musical taste. Billy Joel never did it for me. I just I did, never really cared for him all that much. I've never owned one of his albums. I played at stations. I played his music, but I just nothing... It just never clicked. I, I very, very talented individual. I've heard interviews with him where I, he sounds like a really, really great guy, but none of his music ever appealed to me that much. So I apologize. Uh, Di D, good morning from Diana in Grand Junction, Colorado. Gail Watts is most AM or talk radio. Yeah, in most markets they are, but I've, I've heard of a few that still hang on trying to play that music, <laughs> play that funky music. Um, I remember when w, um, uh, WHND, Honey Radio, was 560 AM. They played oldies from sunrise to sunset, and they signed off at sunset. Uh, and they were actually, uh, they could get away with playing oldies on AM because if it's scratchy, who cares? I mean, you're not, you know, a lot of stuff wasn't even in stereo. <laughs> Slow down, this afternoon delight with 70 songs speak for a nooner. <laughs> yes, exactly. An afternooner. Oh, Bob, blah, blah, points out that auto manufacturers are attempting to eliminate AM radio and new cars. And Bob, that's thank you for checking, by the way. Bob's a good friend of mine. 
Um, and that's interesting because I can't imagine that when you're mass producing radios, it costs all that much to put an FM, uh, put an AM radio in the car. In fact, at this point, to delete it probably costs more money. But they've been talking about that, believe it or not, since the 80s. And I remember a time when the uh, National Association of Broadcasters, I believe it was, was lobbying to pass legislation to force the car companies to tie it so that if the car had an FM, it had to have an AM. And uh, that's one of those things where, you know, there are people out there who, let's face it, if, you know, emergency broadcast system goes off, is it going to reach everybody if they don't have AM radios? So I, um, Grizzly family, what was your first car? The first car I got to drive on a regular basis was a 1974 Gremlin. And the first car I bought was a 1969 Dodge Charger. That's culture shock, going from a Gremlin to a Charger. But Earthbound Misfits says, do you remember the Millie Vanilli fiasco? Of course I do. And I'm going to tell you right now, okay, Millie Vanilli was good music. I like the music. The music was actually good. I was actually listening to a Millie Vanilli song last week. I'm not making that up. The problem was the band was fake. It was a studio musician group from, I think, Germany. And they hired two guys who were dancers to front as the group. But the guys didn't sing, didn't dance. And when they appeared any place, they would lip sync or fake it. And I had friends who saw Millie Vanilli at Pine Knob who came back and said, that was a great show. These guys are great. And then unfortunately, they went and did a show someplace else in the CD. They were literally playing the CD and the CD started skipping, <laughs> which doesn't happen if you're performing live. And of course, then it came out that these guys didn't sing, completely fake. And there's always different gradations. Like there are singers who do, do tour and lip sync to their own music, but these guys are lip syncing to somebody else's music. And so it was a scandal. But I, I'm going to tell you right now, I like their music. I, I, I'm not saying I bought their records or anything, but I, I always thought that Millie Vanilli was good music. I was, was curious to know what would happen if they'd released it with the real band, assuming they could have assembled a real band that could say, yeah, we recorded it and we now are going to go out and perform it. Hazel Montgomery, if you had a pirate radio station, what music would you play? Uh, my personal tastes run all over the place, uh, and I like a little bit of everything. But there'd probably be a lot of obscure off tracks uh, from the 70s and 80s of, of Euro techno pop. <laughs> oh, Ponzi says when the internet crashes, radios will come back. Uh, Lamour, what color was the gremlin? It was green. It was a really ugly shade of green. It was like a metallic light green. It was, it was, it was gross. It was gross. Johnny Knoxville says AM will never go away. I agree. I, yeah, I think, I think the technology being there, I mean, if AM went away, I mean, there's radio stations like WJR in Detroit. I mean, they've been broadcasting since like the 1920s or thirties and they've been in like every Arbitron rating since then. Uh, if AM went away, I mean, you know, that's, that's a pretty big business to go away too. So Randy Pabo says, Steve, would you wear a t-shirt if I made it for you? that says, yeah, you might be cool, but have you lit a piano on fire by dragging it? <laughs> of course I would. I've mentioned before, I wear a double XL. It's a double XL. I know, I know I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm broad shouldered <laughs> and, uh, if it's not political, and it's and it's it's not uh, obscene. I'll wear it. So somebody made me the Woodchuck Whisperer T-shirt last week, and I wore it. Donald Westerdale was an Exorcist green. I believe that that is a good description of it. It was the green that you might have seen during a foul scene in The Exorcist. That's the green the Gremlin was. So Fred Blowers, have you ever seen Trans Siberian Orchestra live? Yes, I have. And I'm going to tell you right now, I did not understand what they were until I saw them. And it is, and after I saw them, I'm like, huh? And so if you don't know, Trans-Siberian Orchestra is a band that tours and they put on a whole stage show, but it's rock and roll, but it's Christmas themed. And they have nothing to do with Siberia. I think they're from Florida. Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And who put them together was a guy who used to stage huge shows for big bands like Queen and The Who and, you know, big, big, big stadium productions. And he came up with the idea of creating his own format of a band that would do a show that would only play big stadiums. 
So they don't ever warm up for anybody. Nobody warms up for them. They tell you, they go, we're going to come out at 8 o'clock. The show starts at 8 o'clock. And it is good. It's a bunch of talented musicians. The, the music is good. The storyline is good. I was blown away. And I would had so many people say, Steve, you've got to see the Trans-Siberian Orchestra play. And I go, what, what are they? I don't even get it. And if you listen to a song or two off the soundtrack, you don't understand. It's, it's the whole package. It's the whole package. So, yes, I've seen them. I enjoyed it. And, and I cannot rave about them enough. Um, Ponzi, is that like the Blue Man? Um, I've not seen Blue Man live. I've seen video of them live. I know who they are and I know what they do. Probably in a, in a roundabout way, they're similar in that sense that they created a show that is so unique, you can't describe it. Can't describe it. Mary Quite says Trans-Siberian Orchestra rocks. Yeah, and I mean, I literally just thought, oh, it's a band, they come out and they do Christmas songs. No, 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 no. It's, it's much, much more than that. So 90 Knots says they give me a headache. <laughs> Too loud? <laughs> Sit further back. <laughs> Jeff Davis says the Woodchuck Affair was epic. Is that what we should call it, the Woodchuck Affair, as opposed to the Woodchuck episode? Uh, Lois Miller, what's the piano toe story? I've been watching for about four years. I can summarize it for you because I told the story on Vin Wiki, but I used to drive a tow truck for the city of Birmingham out of a gas station called Tillard's Mobile at 15 Mile Road and Adams Road. And we would tow anything the police department needed towed, usually wrecked cars. And one day they called up and they said, hey, we need a tow truck. And I said, where? And they said, look out your front window. And I look out there and there's a piano sitting in the middle of the intersection. So me being a ranking person on duty, I jump in the tow truck, drive 20 feet, hook the tow truck to the piano. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never towed a piano before. And I picked it up off the ground and I start driving with it. And a, and a police officer said, take this to the impound lot about a mile and a half that way. I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, I felt it shift behind me, but I couldn't see what happened. But I felt the weight shift, but it was still attached. So I'm still driving, and all of a sudden, I see smoke billowing off the piano, and so I stop, and I'm going to go back there and and look at it. And um, the uh, the police officer gets on his hoot and holler and goes, "Get back in the truck and keep driving." So I get back in the truck and I drive it, and I pull into the impound lot and I jump back there with a fire extinguisher and there's a tow uh the, the piano is attached to the tow truck it's burning it caught on fire it caught on fire because when it shifted it started dragging on the ground and the friction caused it to catch on fire and so I extinguished the piano you know with 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 a, with a fire extinguisher and I, I dumped the burnt piano in the tow yard and the piano had just fallen off a junk truck it wasn't like a Steinway or something uh but I did in fact get paid to tow a burning piano to the impound yard in Birmingham, Michigan, about 1981 or so. True story. True story. Um, I'll be Josh and goodness gracious, great piano on fire. <laughs> My new username 47, I feel BGs were underrated at the time. The BGs are one of the most amazing bands. And I don't want to sit here and talk about music all day. One of my favorite bands of all time. I've never seen them perform live, unfortunately, because now two out of the three are passed. But they had hit so long ago that I was buying their greatest hits album when I was in elementary school, junior high. And I remember they had two greatest hits albums. And then they kind of disappeared. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, Saturday Night Fever. And they have a whole second career from that. And then they continued putting out great music. I love the Bee Gees. I know they get a bad rap. I know that uh, that TV show, one of the TV shows uh, used to make fun, Mad TV used to make fun of them. And they have a unique style. And anytime there's a band where a song you've never heard this before comes on and you can say, wait, I know who that is. Well, that's something. That is something. And so you, they have a very distinctive, unique sound, very, very talented. I've seen those guys appear on a talk show where they're sitting there talking, all three of them talking to a, a, an interviewer. And the interviewer asks them a question about a song and they just break into song. And these guys have been singing together their entire lives, and it shows. And so if the music doesn't appeal to you, there's nothing much I can say, but they are amazing, absolutely amazing. Gail Watson loved Bee Gees. William, never tow a piano, but can you tow a fish? <laughs> Gene Montgomery, Rick Springfield, make sure you bring a suitcase full of cash for payment and hope it doesn't get forfeited. Yeah, uh, by the way, there's a big article. I might do a follow-up about the theater 
in Michigan where Rick Springfield paid, uh, he played and didn't get paid. And now it turns out that there was money that was supposed to be there and it got diverted. And the question is who diverted the money? And there's all kinds of resignations and finger pointing. We'll see what happens, but it's getting ugly. But it, it brought Rick Springfield back into headlines uh, for a little bit. Betty Boops and Steve met Alice Cooper. Well, you know something? I, I forget if I mentioned something like that, somebody will remember it. I was at a bar in New York City in the mid-1980s. A friend of mine goes, hey, that's Alice Cooper. And I look over and I'm like, oh, that's Alice Cooper. He's not wearing makeup, but yeah, that's that's Alice Cooper, all right. And uh, so we, me and my friends walk over. And the funniest thing of all is one of my friends goes, oh, my gosh, Alice Cooper, I love your music. And they shake hands with him. My other friend goes, oh, I've got this album, that album. And they shake hands. I go, hey, Alice, I'm from Detroit. And he goes, hey, how you doing? And he turns his back to my friends who are also from Detroit. <laughs> he just starts talking to me because he hears that all the time. I love your music. I love your music. He's from Detroit. I'm from Detroit also. We sat and talked. We're from Detroit. I'm from Birmingham, but I work in Royal Oak. Oh, I love that area. And we start talking about Michigan, you know? So there we go. Carlene Stinson likes the BGs too. Thank you very much. Perishable Goods is Fire, the Crazy World of Steve Latell. <laughs> An homage to the Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Fire. That's a great song. That's, 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 there's a one hit wonder for you. And that guy's live stage show involved, I believe, an apparatus on his headset that sprayed fire. <laughs> I've got a story. I don't know if I can do it justice, but Johnny Knoxville points out I also met Def Leppard. I met two members of the band Def Leppard backstage at a show in Saginaw, Michigan, a few years back. I got a photograph of it kicking around here somewhere, but I can't put it up on screen because it's not that handy. But um, when I was uh, in the mid 1980s, I worked for a company that sold sunglasses. And we used to go to these trade shows in New York. In fact, that's where I met Alice Cooper, was in New York at a trade show where I was just hanging out at night at a bar, which I do quite often because I don't drink. But here's the funny part. Uh, I used to bring a boom box and I would put together mixtapes of cool music to play in our booth. So when people walked by, it wasn't just dead, dead air. Okay, so I'd play cool music. And I actually, people stop by and go, oh, what station are you listening to? I'm like, oh, this is the mixtape. I mean, oh my God, this is cool music. And so I had these mixtapes at four of them. And I remember there's called Booth One, Two, Three, and Four. And one of the tapes, these are 90 minute tapes with a you know 45 on the side, and it was an auto reverse deck. So it sit there and go back and forth. And I actually had one tape that had just enough room on it for one small song. And I because I didn't want a dead air because it'd take too long to reverse. So I stuck in the crazy world of Arthur Brown's fire. And you'll recall it starts off with a guy yelling, fire. And there were these <laughs> little old ladies coming down the aisle. I don't know what they're doing at this trade show. Coming down the aisle. And this, this the last song had ended. And just as she stepped in front of the boom box, it goes, fire. Da, da, da. And I'll see you burn. And the woman does one of these. Like she thought like Satan was talking to her. <laughs> if I had a film of that. I could make a fortune. It would go viral. It would go viral. This woman honestly thought she was being raptured the wrong direction. It was, it was, it was so funny. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that song. USS Grey Ghost, I have seen Bon Jovi live. I have not, but I like a couple songs by Mr. John Bon Jovi. Um, My new user in 47 is pointing out that Barry was the older one. Uh, There's Maurice and Robin, and then Andy was the younger one who's not in the band. He had a solo career. Uh, sadly, he uh, passed away. He had a, apparently a, some kind of substance abuse problem. Stephen Cook says, I met Peter Noon when working in a gas station. Only famous person I met while working in a gas station was Billy Sims. Billy Sims. He was the guy before Barry Sanders, where the Detroit Lions thought they could you know, win a championship. By having one good player. And hey, uh, hand the ball to Billy like 45 times. And maybe we'll win. Which they did with Barry Sanders. We'll hand the ball to him 45 times and maybe we'll win. But uh, a human highlight reel will not always win you the game. But he was the nicest guy. Nicest guy. So. Gordon861 says, I am the god of hellfire. It's my mom's ringtone. <laughs> Harry Weitzman, Joan Jett, or Pat Benatar. I never liked Joan Jett that much because she did a bunch of covers. I love rock and roll and Crimson and Clover. Um, 
you know, if, if you spend your career doing covers, uh, puts you in the same group in my mind as, as like, I don't know, Tiffany. Um, going to get a whole bunch of people down here upset with me. I know I am. Um, Joe Cram, glad to see you doing lives again. Joe, good to see you, my friend, as well. Kevin Z met Pat Benatar. Uh, I heard she's a, a diminutive woman. Isn't she kind of short? Is she kind of, I, and I know that she also had issues, I believe, early in her career. She was under so much pressure to remain uh, thin, slender, that occasionally she had issues. Um, but that's a long time ago. Yeah, Jack PM, the Lions did that for years. Throw it to Megatron. Yeah, it, it, and, and it wasn't until they realized, like, hey, we need more than one good player. We need a, a, we need a couple good players. <laughs> eBay, LOL, LOL, Tiffany. You know, what's really funny is um, I think we're alone now. At Tommy James and the Shondells uh, is a fabulous song. It's a classic song. It's it's one of those songs that, that I can hear over and over again and go, that's just a masterpiece. It's been covered by so many people, including Tiffany. And uh, I, I was poking around the internet the other day and I came across a version by Lenny Lovitch. Lenny Lovitch, who did the song My Lucky Number. Did a cover of I Think We're Alone Now. It's not bad, but it's just a cover, you know. And I saw somebody wrote underneath it and said, oh, I didn't realize this is a cover. I'm only familiar with Tiffany's version. And it's like, huh? So, I, you know, I, I, I do feel bad. I've, I'll admit I've heard a song before not knowing it was a cover. And somebody says, oh, by the way, do you realize that was a cover? You know, back in the New York groove was, was a cover that Ace Freely did. And for years, I didn't know that it was a cover of a, in essence, almost like a disco song. But But he did rock it up very, very well. But I didn't know for the longest time it was a cover. So Johnny Knox says, we need Wayne Fonts and Rodney Pete. <laughs> what about Chuck Long? Chuck Long was a quarterback. Talk about a name. Chuck Long. What's the play? Go back and Chuck it long. So QA Library is still doing work for My, My TV. Not lately. Uh, there's a couple technical issues that never worked out. I still hang out with those guys. I'm friends with those guys. Uh, I talked to my producer about a week ago, but have not have not been on there for a little while. eBay, Tears for Fears or Big Country? You know, that's interesting. There's a couple of songs by each of them I like. I know Big Country uh, has at least one of the major players that passed away. I love the song In a Big Country, which, of course, is a title song. And I always have interesting thoughts about bands that have a song and then take the name of their band from the song or vice versa. So Talk Talk had a song called Talk Talk. Uh, and there's also a, a band called Living in a Box, and they had a hit with a song called Living in a Box. And my famous joke, of course, is where are they today? Living in a Box. So um, it's 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 funny because it's true. Um, Burning Sensation said the Fine Young Cannibals did lots of covers. They did, but they also mixed them up a little bit. So Ever Fallen in Love, for instance, is an old Buzzcocks song. But if you ever heard the Buzzcocks version, it does not sound like the Fine Young Cannibal version. So I love it when someone takes a song that can be good or bad and redoes it their own way. And so the problem I had with Tiffany's version of I Think We're Alone Now, she did the exact same arrangement. And the only difference is her vocal. And it's it, her vocal ain't so good that it's like, hey, we're going to recover everything with Tiffany instead of Tommy James. <laughs> Carleen says, it irks me when people say Dolly Parton's song was actually a Whitney Houston song. Well, Whitney may have done it. And my, understand, my understanding is that, that Dolly makes a lot of money off of that version by Whitney Houston. But so she doesn't mind the cover, I'm sure. But yeah, you got to give her credit. Dolly Parton's one of those people also. I'll admit, I, I don't own any Dolly Parton records. I can only name two or three songs by her. But I worked at radio and had to play her songs at a country station. But I know that she is an extremely intelligent woman. Uh, and she's classy. She's, she's really got her act together. So slow down says, I wonder if Alice Cooper is going around saying I met Steve Leto. I doubt it. <laughs> but I have to admit, I've mentioned before once in a while, Jerry Cease is living in a box in a van down by the river. That would be a step up from simply living in a box, right? Um, in a van down by the river. Um, but I, I, I get recognized places, which blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. I, I was up in Copper Harbor a couple of years ago sitting eating breakfast, and I see a guy doing this, looking at me. Finally, are, are you Steve Leto? Yeah, 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 I am. And so I, I, it happens. And I went to a funeral yesterday. I went to a funeral. 
And there's a lot of people I don't know there because there's friends of family and family of friends. And, they, you know, and this guy walks through and says, hey, Steve, nice to meet you. And I go, uh, nice to meet you too. And he tells me his name. And he goes, I watch you on YouTube. <laughs> I got recognized at a funeral. Johnny Knoxville, Iron Butterfly, uh, Inna Gata Da Vida, uh, is one of those songs. There probably are books written about it. There could very well be uh, books written about it. But uh, In a God of the Vita, of course, is a drunken rendition of the phrase in the Garden of Eden. And uh, Iron Butterfly, of course, I think the original album track is ungodly long. And I know that it jokingly became the, the song that most disc jockeys at heavy metal stations or AOR stations would tell you, album rock stations, is the song they'd put on the turntable and they had to go to the men's room if the men's room was far away. <laughs> Uh, Locked on Loss is Dolly Parton's biggest song was written by Barry Gibb. Uh, talking about islands in the stream, I assume. And uh, that is one of those songs. The, 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 the Gibbs, uh, the Bee Gees, did write a bunch of stuff for other people. I believe Dionne Warwick's Heartbreaker is another example of that. And then occasionally you'll find out that the Bee Gees also did versions of some of these songs, either before or after they're covered by somebody else. But the Bee Gees put out so much music that they had extra good songs laying around and give them to people. Hey, you record this and whatever. So <laughs> STP world says Dolly Parton replies to fans. That's cool. That's cool. Jim's camera at dawn says that the album version of in a God of David is over 16 minutes long. Doesn't surprise me. One of my brothers had that album. I remember hearing it at least once. <laughs> in fact, it might still be playing. I don't know. Uh, Perishable Goods, Marilyn Manson's covers are amazing, such as Sweet Dreams. I would agree with you on that. I'm not a big fan of his because I, I think a lot of what he's doing is shtick. It's like an act. But but uh, his version of Sweet Dreams is an interpretation that makes it his own. Slow down, everybody. Wang Chung tonight. <laughs> There's an episode of Cheers where Frazier walks in and attempts to be cool, says something to that effect. Oh, boy. USS Grey Ghost, what was the funniest or weirdest court case you were a part of? I haven't had that many weird cases. I've heard of some and seen some, but uh, I haven't had any. Harvey Wiseman, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. Again, one of those songs I never really cared for. I, I know people who love it. It just never did it for me. I won't insult music I don't like or don't care for, uh, but it just does nothing for me. I, that's all I'm going to say. Steve from STP World. I have a really cool cube-shaped 100-disc CD changer for music. 100-disc CD changer? Wow. Wow. Um, I've still got a lot of CDs laying around. I still like owning the physical media. Uh, MDM... M, is it Dr. Mel Estrange? I don't know how to say it. DJs put an iron butterfly and they want to take a smoke break. A smoke break or the other kind. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and <sighs> Stephen Tomas says, Alice Cooper is not a person. It's a band. I believe if you walked up to him and addressed him as Alice Cooper, he will respond. Uh, likewise, I've, I've seen him being billed as uh, Alice Cooper doing interviews and so on. They don't say so-and-so of the band Alice Cooper. But I know that can get confusing. There are, there are band names that sound like people like Jethro Tull. I uh, never met the man, but <laughs> I actually had a friend once who thought Led Zeppelin was a guy whose first name was Led. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that guy's music. Leds? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, Williams is the best concert I've ever seen. Super Tramp at the Paramount Theater in downtown Portland in Oregon, 1980s. Uh, you know, I don't remember them touring that much. They may have made so much money off the albums they didn't need to tour that much. Ever heard of the astronaut cover band Max Q? Uh, most of their members are astronauts. Well, I know that Matt, there's a band called Max Q that has a song called Way of the World, which was a side project for the guy from NXS. Maybe it's a different band you're thinking of. Um... <laughs> Yeah, like that guy, Pink Floyd. By the way, which one of you is pink? Somebody asked that. Um, 
Joe Cram says Alice Cooper was the babysitter of one of my coworkers at a mission in Arizona before he was famous. Yeah, I do know that there are a lot of bands from Michigan uh, that used to play a place called the Palladium in Birmingham. And the Palladium was just a little warehouse that probably, I don't know, 100 people could get into. People like Alice Cooper and Bob Seger uh, and uh, The Frost uh, and probably Grand Funk played there at a time when you could literally, like, like I, I think the stage was on the floor. I think it was literally, like, there was no, like, even elevation. Like you, and I know people who say, oh, yeah, I saw that guy at the Palladium referring to some band that's huge now. <laughs> it's amazing those things happen. Um, Ramblin' Gamblin' Man by Bob Seger. Yeah, Bob Seger showed up the Woodward Dream Cruise a couple years ago. A whole bunch of people sending photographs of him in the passenger seat waving to people. <laughs> hey, that's Bob Seger in that car. Turns out it really was. The Booze King, have you ever had a gotcha moment in a court case? No, but I can tell you right now, I have I had a lot of fun cross-examining somebody at a deposition or, I, or in a court case where I had the goods on them and they, and they wanted to fight. And uh, I could do an entire video. In fact, I might do an entire video on that. Um, I once got a guy on the record to admit to like 100, 150 misdemeanors in a row. <laughs> His attorneys are sitting next to him with their hand over her face. And I'm looking at her kind of like, you want this to keep going or do you want to stop? Case settled shortly thereafter. Uh, Tracy Weir says, hi, Steve, my first live. And uh, I'm going to have to apologize because we're going to actually be cutting it short in a few minutes. Because uh, I unfortunately got to be someplace at three o'clock. But I appreciate that for checking in. Locked on losses. Motown gave us everything. And Michigan gave us Ted Nugent. Um, I've seen Ted Nugent live. And I still use that as a gauge to describe how loud something can be. I've been to the hydroplane races in Detroit. I've stood next to an unmuffled NASCAR Hemi motor indoors that was fired up. And I've been at a Ted Nugent concert. And all three of them peg the meter. If it goes to 11, it was pegged at 11. So... Jerry Cease, as long as Steve wears his Jimi Hendrix shirts from time to time, there's still hope for the world. I believe they are still. I think believe they still are in the mix over here. A Grand Funk Railroad famously is from Michigan and uh, were gigantic in the 70s uh, and then kind of fell off the radar. And it's, it's a fascinating story. They had a problem with their um, management. It was a guy named Terry Knight. And Terry Knight at one point in time was a disc jockey at CKLW. And he's also the lead singer of a band called Terry Knight and the Pack. They had a local hit with a song called Mr. You're a Better Man Than I. And he was managing them and I believe also producing their records, at least some of them. And um, they were they were huge, huge for a while. So um, they made a lot of money. Um, locked on losses. Yeah, Mark Farner got screwed. Mark Farner, Mel Shocker, uh, and Donnie Brewer are the guys. Uh, and... Um, Mark Farner wrote a book. I've met him. Mel Shocker, nice guy. I've met him also. Also met him and his wife. Never met Donnie Brewer. So I've met two-thirds of Grand Funk or Grand Funk Railroad, as they're known in their earlier days. Nate Fish points out that Kid Rock and Eminem are also both from Michigan. Indeed, they are. Kid Rock's from a little town called Romeo, up towards the thumb. And Eminem, famously, is from someplace near 8 Mile in Detroit. I did an interview with the BBC a while back, and they played an intro of Detroit, and they rolled a camera underneath the bridge where it says Eight Mile Road, and they started playing the theme, you know, the Eight Mile song for Eminem at that point as a signal to the rest of the world that, yes, we are in Detroit. Uh, Bill Gorman went to a Leonard Skinner concert in 1977. And Ben Leach asks the most important question of the day, which I will answer, and I'm going to end it on this note. I apologize. First album I ever bought was a new world record by ELO, ELO. And because I've got in the room right now with me, 600 of my closest friends, I'm going to tell you something else. I got tickets recently to see ELO in Detroit. They'll be here in October. I missed them the last time around. So I made it my goal in life to get good tickets to this show. And I got front row tickets. <laughs> so I'm seeing a lot of shows this summer. I've already seen a few. I'm going to see... Uh, Blue October, this upcoming Saturday in Detroit. But when ELO comes to Little Caesars Arena, I will be in the front row 
And they are the guys who made the album that I first bought a new world record back in the day. So that's going to wrap it up for me. I will talk to you guys next weekend. I'll try to announce in advance when I'll do the live stream on the weekend. It might be Friday, it might be Saturday, it might be Sunday. And I'll try to get the time out and I'll try to be on time next time. Okay, so until then, behave yourself. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.